An old Russian chronicle relates that Prince Vladimir of Kiev in the 10th and 11th centuries AD could not decide which faith to adopt for himself and his people until his envoys reported from Constantinople that they had witnessed services there. We knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, they declared, for on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss to describe it. We know only that God dwells there among men. He was talking, of course, about the glorious Hagia Sophia in the heart of the city now known as Istanbul. It is no accident that that structure and the symbolism it carries is copied by Orthodox churches around the world. Hello, I'm Yanis Simonidis. Today we continue with Holy Cross Live, our new series of programs videotaped on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts. This series of programs is designed to introduce you to the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. Today's program is Ecclesia, the art and architecture of the Orthodox Church. And our guests are His Grace Bishop Gerasimus of Avidos, Professor Emeritus of Holy Cross, and Reverend Dr. Alkiviadis Kalivas, the Dean of Holy Cross. Your Grace, thank you for coming. Welcome, Father Kalivas. Wonderful to see you again. What was, before, the, before the, the, this church structure, this design came into being, what was the official gathering place of the church at the very beginnings? Well, before I answer that question, let me say how much I appreciated uh, the, what you read about the Chronicle, the Russian Chronicle, how much it resonates in my heart and the personal experience I had mm. visiting Constantinople for the first time some 30 years ago and entering the Church of Hagia Sophia. I relate very much to what the emissaries of Prince Vladimir said, uh, sensing this enormous, massive building, yet at the same time, very beautiful, very heavenly and celestial. It is indeed the most wonderful building of the Orthodox Church. And though the mosaics have been covered and its splendor is hidden beneath the asbestos, somehow or other, uh, you cannot help but be captured by the beauty of that house of God. Uh, more importantly than the experience that one has in Hagia Sophia, feeling oneself to be uh, not knowing like the emissaries, whether they're on, in earth or on, in heaven, is the fact that St. Sophia has been the place where the orthodox liturgical experience has been forged. Our entire liturgical experience as we know and experience today and understand it has been uh, worked itself out in this magnificent cathedral and is played out on smaller stages throughout the world. But returning to your question, the early Christian community worshipped in private homes. We know that from the Book of Acts. And as the faith spread and the church grew, uh, Christians very early began to acquire their own church properties. And these were mostly house churches. Uh, most recently, a, such a house church of the early third century was discovered and unearthed mm -hmm. in Dura Europis in Syria. But with the peace of Constantine, uh, 
when the persecutions ceased and the church began to flourish, mm -hmm. uh, they, the church started to uh, arrange its own church buildings and it chose a building uh, that was quite popular in those days, the Basilica. A, was, that, was that a Roman building initially, or Roman architecture? Or? It was a building that was very common in the East and the West, um, used uh, for, as a marketplace, as a um, public building uh, for all kinds of activities. And the church chose called, this building. Very sorry. It was called Basilica. What was the reason for that, and did it have any relationship with its shape, and what was its shape? The shape of the building uh, was a three-aisled building with an apse at the far end of the entrance. And it is this uh, building that the church chose to use as its basic structure. Uh, in the Eastern Church, there were two basic arrangements of the early church building the early Syrian floor plan, which had the synthronon, the bishop's throne and the benches of the presbyters in the nave of the church, and later the Constantinopolitan floor plan, which placed the synthronon in the apse. Uh, in both churches, the apse contained the holy table, mm -hmm. and the uh, sanctuary was separated from the nave by a small barrier, uh, which later developed into the Iconostasio. Which we will talk about, yes. A later <clears throat> uh, presentation and development of the church building, the Basilica, uh, was the one adopted in Constantinople with the use of the dome. Now the Basilica became a domed basilica. And ever since then, there have been variations of these church buildings throughout the Orthodox world. Basically, the traditional Orthodox building is this basilica with a dome. And the most popular variation, perhaps, is it the one that now has a, a, a cross to it? That's how you want to emphasize that the faith or the architectures, they try to play with the cross of the church, to play so different ways of churches, but the cross, the cross are all inside, outside, to play, I couldn't say, with the cross, to express their faith, their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The building of the church is there for the people to worship, to commune, commune with God, with our Lord Jesus Christ and with the sense, the image of the total community, heaven and earth of heaven together, and heaven and earth. But basic of the cross, cross, the means of our salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to me that what the bishop is saying is something significant, that all the liturgical art in the church seeks to be an expression of its theology, of its mm -hmm. understanding of God, and of the humankind. And so the painter with his brush and his own artistic skills, always following uh, the, the sense of tradition, the poet with his hymn, the musicians with his melody, and the architect with his vision of the church. And the basic vision of the Orthodox Church has to do, I think, with this uh, basic truth of the church the kenosis of God, the emptying of God, God's incarnation, God coming to us. And for what purpose? The deification of the humankind and of the cosmos. All that is played out in all the art forms of the church. I have to admit that I had not heard before the kenosis of God, the emptying of yeah, God. Is our, our Lord Jesus Christ, eternally being with God, He emptied Himself. He mm -hmm. humbled Himself, came uh -huh. down to help us. This is for St. Paul a beautiful expression of our faith. Uh, what do we believe in the person of Christ? And what he has done in his, his epistle to the Philippians chapter 2 is beautifully described, poetically, dogmatically, 
how our Lord Jesus Christ, being eternally in the form of God, together with God the Father, he decided to humble himself, to come down, to become a man, to work like a man, to be crucified like a man on behalf of, of, of all the people. And uh, therefore, Christ, uh, God raised him up and gave him the name, the name above every name, the, so that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Mm -hmm. This is the Lord there. This is the confession of Paul about the Lordship of our Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So that every tongue would bow down and worship Christ in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. <laughs> the, the, the whole universe to worship our Lord. And we call this empty, empty in himself. Yeah. One of the chief characteristics of an Orthodox church building is to relate this through art form. And this is uh, done through the use of domes and apses and arches. And the purpose of that is to show uh, the presence of God in the world. It is to manifest his love. It is uh, to indicate that God takes the initiative and God is embracing his creation. In terms of that? The through the dome, through the arches, through the apses, uh, God bending the heavens to come mm -hmm. to the earth. Uh, this is also the reason that in the domes of the church is the icon of the Pandocrator, Christ the Almighty. Uh, who holds the gospel, the book, who himself is the interpreter of his word and blessing uh, humanity, blessing the world. And he is the risen and reigning Lord and therefore in his risen body and glorified body, all of creation by anticipation uh, is glorified. And so it speaks about the transfigured world and that's why the church building seeks to manifest this right. faith. That's what I wanted to ask you, but also not only the dome here, but also the, uh, the, the half dome on the apse mm -hmm. has Platitera, the, 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 the virgin. Correct. There too. Uh, if you uh, look at a ch enter an Orthodox church building, a traditional church building, the eye is led by the architectural style to the dome and from the dome to the apse. The and there's this connection of an iconographic scheme. Mm -hmm. And the scheme is so beautifully, so beautiful in that surrounding the... May I, may I interrupt you? Sure. Before we go to the iconographic, may I ask for the basic parts of, of the, the, the Greek Orthodox Church, whether it is a basilica or not. Mm -hmm. It is broken down in certain areas that have usually the same names. They symbolize certain things and they function in particular ways. There are three main parts to the Orthodox Church building. Uh, the narthex, a kind of vestibule which leads into the church proper. It is the place where in more ancient times uh, parts of the daily office were said there. More frequently today it is used uh, as the place where the faithful enter the church, they light their candles, uh, make venerations of the icons. Then they enter the nave, the central part of the church, the most massive part of the church where the faithful um, pray, the men, the women, the children, and then the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is the place of the clergy, there where the Eucharist is conducted, celebrated, other parts of the church's prayer services. Uh, the central focus and central piece of furniture of the church building, if we can say that, is the holy table, which is located in the apse, which is part of the sanctuary. And also another important focus, the second focus of the church building is on the amvon, from where the scriptures are read and from where the sermon is delivered. Uh, these constitute the two foci the reading of scripture and the enactment of the Eucharist on the Holy, on the holy Table. Now, something very characteristic about the, the Orthodox Church is the iconostasi. 
Your Grace, can you can you tell us how did it come into 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 being and what does it represent? We are human beings and we are related to God and went if possible even to find and touch God himself. But as human beings we cannot touch God directly and we have the icons. Even Plato uses the term icon to present the original, the idea. And from the very beginning, and even before Christ, we have the use of icons. But from the very beginning, we use the icons in the catacombs, the first, uh, uh, the first churches, religious, the first gathering uh, places. The uh, first gathering of the churches. But as we see by the development of the freedom, the expression of the art, uh, the art we have to emphasize gave itself completely to the worship of God. That's why the best buildings, even before Christ, Parthenon is the beauty of the art in faith, in religion. The same thing, especially in Byzantium. They gave all their heart to the church. The church is heaven on earth. The church is heaven on earth. In Christ, the heaven came down to earth, really, together. The iconostasion developed over a long period of time yeah. from a short barrier to a more uh, pronounced no, that's screen. That's what, what I wanted to say. And we have the icons to help us to feel this unity with heaven and earth, that God is here, where we well, are. This is the house of God, but is God is here. And God is Christ, especially we have seen uh, God in Christ and has the first place in our temple that's there. That's why the, the icons are called windows to heaven. To heaven. Right. But in terms of iconostasi, uh, now, and, and I want to go back to, to the, the, the hierarchy of the, of the icon, uh, iconography in the, in the church building. How did this structure come into being? What, what, what is it historically and, and what is its function? Well, I suppose basically we are dealing with one aspect of the Old Testament idea of veiling the Holy of Holies. And therefore, that created the sense that the sanctuary should be have some kind of separation mm -hmm. uh, of distinction, not separation from the nave. And uh, the early churches had a low barrier. In time, columns were added to the barrier, but still the sanctuary was visible. In uh, late medieval times, we have the beginnings of the present iconostasion as we know it today with the icons which were began to be hung on the columns, uh, took up the space uh, of the intercolumnia, and then kind of became a screen that in fact veils the sanctuary. There are attempts today in the Orthodox Church to restructure the iconostasion to a much simpler barrier and for more visibility of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. There is a scheme by which the icons are placed on the iconostasion. The prominent place is given to the icon of Christ and then to his right on the other side of the holy gate is uh, the Theotokos always with the Christ child. Was there any, were there any, any other reasons for that separation? Was it, uh, 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 there are stories that, that people uh, uh, relate that it was also for political reasons or at times when uh, the emperor of Byzantium was allowed in there, there was for separation between the no, people. No, I don't him. think that any of these yeah. things. Are there liturgical elements in terms of there's a special relationship between the priest and the altar? And no, simply again, I think it's very important to indicate clearly that there's no division All right. and separation in, the, in those terms, but that in fact, through the use of the barrier and the icon screen, we have a distinction a distinction of roles, a distinction of function but also the sense, uh, as Saint uh, Maximus the Confessor says uh, in using some symbolism of the, of the, of the church building, he calls an, uh, the church, the nave, the world, and the sanctuary, heaven. And he says, uh, 
the sanctuary is the world in, in process to become deified, mm -hmm. transfigured, and therefore kind of uh, brings the things together in, in a sense of, of uh, completeness and fullness. The one is and via, the one on the way, on and the, the way. other, the there. one that is complete and fulfilled. Um, in this respect, I think we should look at the temple and its um, uh, uh, the use of the iconostasion. Significantly, the nave is a Greek word, which means not, which is nafs, which means ship. Ship. Uh, it's very interesting, therefore, that the church is the ark, the ark of salvation, and the ark has a destiny, has a purpose, and the ark invites everyone to salvation. Uh, we mentioned before the iconographic scheme of the church Oops. and this loveliness of the, of the scheme that is uh, the scripture in action, uh, the gospel in action, Christ the Pandocrator, the Almighty, uh, below him the angelic host who sing the thrice holy hymn, uh, then the prophets, as we go, as we as go we down, down, as we descend, the prophets of the Old Testament who proclaim the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah has come, the gospel has been preached, and therefore the four evangelists on the pendants that hold up the dome. Aha, uh -huh. all right. And then as the apse comes, we are reminded of the uh, Jacob's ladder, of uh, the angels ascending and descending. And the apse with the Theotokos is Jacob's ladder. The Theotokos mm -hmm. is that which unites heaven and earth. She is the one who gives. She's the bridge. The, the bridge. Unite Christ, God, and the world. The world. The church. And then below, the Theotokos would be the Eucharist, the image or the icon of the Eucharist. The Last the, Supper. The Last Supper, where, in fact, the humankind is united with God and we become partakers of divine nature. And below that would be uh, icons of the hierarchs, the bishops of the church. Mm -hmm. And then they all lead to the center, which is the holy table, where the union of heaven and earth is enacted at the Eucharist. Now, what about the icons in the, the remaining part of the nave or in the narthex? In general, we have icons that depict sacred events, sacred persons, I, uh, uh, saints. And uh, there too, we have the martyrs, the ascetics, the great oh. teachers of the faith. Uh, we are reminded of the con continuity of faith and the history of the church. But more importantly, through the icons, we are invited to see the fire of divine love acting in the world, acting in the lives of human beings. We are invited to participate and experience the brilliance of his beauty. And in the end, I think uh, the church, in some significant way, tries to say what the Old Testament says about the creation of the world. Uh, at the end of each creative act in the book of Genesis, uh, the words say that God saw and it was good. But in the Greek, he says, theos oti kalon. And kalon is beautiful. beautiful. Not only beautiful, but the word, Greek word tries to it's translate the Greek, the Hebrew word, which is the combination of good and beautiful. And so the Orthodox church building tries through its architecture, through its uh, decorative uh, system to uh, indicate this beauty and this goodness of creation, this immense value that God has placed on his creation, on the world, on human life. Your Grace, you have traveled widely. Uh, there are many, many different kinds of, uh, I assume, uh, of um, Orthodox architecture around the world. Perhaps the most recognizable is perhaps the Russian Orthodox architecture. Is there, are there major differences in the church structures of the, the, uh, the, the remaining Orthodox churches around the world, inside and out? I, 
I could say the basic for the Orthodox churches as we started the Basilica and then the Byzantine churches which playing with the cross. Small variations there are everywhere, even in Greece itself, in various uh, areas, there are small differences, but basically are the same. If, for instance, the Russian, they have a little different trulus there, it's just- yeah. Onion shape. Uh, onion shape for dome. them, onion shaped dome. I've read it, somewhere where they say they're, they're like um, flames of, of uh, fire, and the flames uh -huh. of fire of prayer. Rising. The basic is the dome. Yeah, that's right. Okay. One important characteristic of the Orthodox Church, which we haven't mentioned, which I think is very basic, mm -hmm. is that the traditional Orthodox Church is built on the proportions of the human being. In order for the human being never to feel overwhelmed by the church building, but rather to sense uh, the building as embracing him, and therefore God is embracing him. Uh, the scale is on the human scale. Nothing. Well, yes, even the Hagia immense, Sophia. even the immense building of Hagia Sophia, yeah. the way it is built, the proportions consistently follow the scale of the human being. So the human being is never lost in that magnificent space. As a matter of fact, recently I've been speaking to. A, pre, a young priest who has just visited uh, Constantinople and for the first time went into St. Sophia. And he said he was impressed with the massiveness, with the light of the beauty, which is another characteristic, the use of natural light to penetrates mm -hmm. the building and just disperses, the light is dispersed on the mosaics everywhere and there's just this brilliance and this liveness about it. He said, I felt as if it was a parish church. Even though it seems to fit thousands of people, I felt that I was home in a parish church, a small parish church. And For me, this is the main thing. The church is to have a, in a whole, God sends angels, people all together. This is, and this is all the iconography and everything has this in purpose to show the unity of the universe. I have nothing to add to that. I'm Yanis Simonidis for Illuminations. You've been watching Holy Cross Live. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>